And hello everyone at home, welcome back to another Wednesday evening at Cambridge University Astronomy. We have a real run of luck. We've got another clear night for you. So after our first talk, we're going to switch over to the Cambridge Astronomical Association who are going to do some live stargazing. And they've already seen they've got their telescopes lined up on some pretty interesting things. Um, before that, I'm here with our speaker. I, uh, our speaker today is Stefan Heimsheim. He is a third year PhD student here at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Uh, he's going to be telling us all about fast radio bursts. Um, I will say uh, some of you I can see already have found the YouTube chat box. It's down there in the corner. If you have any uh, questions for our speaker um, throughout the talk or at the end, uh, stick them down there in the chat and I will make sure the speaker gets the questions. Uh, so, yeah, with that, uh, over to you, Stefan. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, um, I'm Stefan. You might have seen me here before at some of the Ask Astronomer live streams. And today I want to tell you a bit about my research with past radio bursts. So these, these radio bursts, what are those? Those are basically very short, very bright bursts of energy that we can observe on Earth with our telescopes. And as the name says, they're in the radio wavelength. So what we use to see them are radio telescopes. So I've shown you here a few with pictures. Um, up here you see the um, Parkes telescope, which um, is in, in Australia. It's basically a big metal dish that um, can collect radio waves and uh, can measure um, these signals from space. And um, similarly, for example, Arecibo here is a just much, much bigger dish, which is in Puerto Rico, was in Puerto Rico before it collapsed, um, which is a, a very big dish that's in a valley. Um, so to be very sensitive to collect as many radiation as possible. Um, it can although only kind of look right at the top, so it's kind of a limited um, field of view, but it's a very good telescope to kind of observe these fast radio bursts about which I'll tell you a bit more in a second. Um, another one, ASCAP, is an array of telescopes. So basically you take parks times 36, also in Australia, and um, this allows you, of course, those are a bit smaller than parks. Um, it's, it's not that, that great, but there, there are lots of telescopes. So what this does is you can use them to observe the sky and you can point where signals come from. So that's um, by kind of looking at how does the signal differ from the one telescope to the other one. Um, and finally, here on the bottom right, you see the Chime telescope. That's a telescope in Canada, where um, you see it looks very different than the other ones. So this one has lots of cylinders as opposed to kind of dishes as um, antennas. And this allows you to look at a much larger part of the sky. So as opposed to just looking at one point in the sky, you look at a whole band, and then while the Earth rotates, you can kind of scan through the sky. And all these telescopes, we have them here. Uh, well, not only for that, but that's what I like to use them for, is um, to observe fast radio bursts. Um, so to get into a bit more detail of what these bursts are. Um, you know the electromagnetic spectrum where we have all the energies of radiation from very high energies on the left-hand side, like gamma rays, X-rays, et cetera, to UV radiation, visible radiation, infrared, what we can observe with kind of normal, more normal telescopes um, on the ground or in space, like the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope. And then on the very long end, on the low energy end of the radiation, we have the radio waves. So those are essentially the waves that you can also receive with kind of a normal radio, but also we can receive signals from space in this wavelength. And now let's get to these fast radio bursts. So basically, as the name says, they're very short bursts of energy. And you can't hear them in real life, but I've made a, I've, well, I've taken a version from um, KC Law um, that has kind of converted those into a different frequency that you can actually hear the signal. And so to illustrate this, I'll, I'll play the sound here for a second. So this was a very short, kind of a almost real-time example of this radio burst. I'll play it again in a few seconds. Um, so this burst is very short, only a few hundred milliseconds. And if you hear um, precisely, you hear a lot of noise. And then you hear like a sweeping sound that goes through. Uh, let me play this one more time. And this sweeping sound that you hear there, that's this fast radio burst. So on the top here, you see this, what we call a waterfall plot. So what it shows you is how strong of a signal we observe as a function of time. So on the x-axis, you have the time. And on the y-axis, you have the frequency. So you see, when do we observe a signal at what frequency? And this kind of diagonal line that you see here, this is this fast radio burst signal. So it's a very short um, kind of sound at a certain frequency. 
and it arrives later at different frequencies. So that's why you hear this sweeping sound, because it starts with the high frequencies, and the frequency gets lower and lower and lower. And this is kind of the signal you, you hear. And to illustrate this, I have one more recording, and that's kind of slowed down so you can, and with noise removed, so you can hear it a lot better. And essentially, um, this is kind of what you want to discover with this um, telescope. So it's, it's, as I said, not audio, it's actually radio waves that you couldn't listen to. It's edited so that you can listen to it. But that's the idea of you have some kind of signal which kind of changes in frequency over time, like this line here. And uh, we can measure this and, and discover this. And actually, we've only discovered this a few years ago. So up until, say, five years ago, we only do a handful of these signals. And actually, the first one we have discovered in 2007. So this is a very new pheno pheno phenomenon. Um, and before I continue with this talk, I also want to emphasize again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them already in the chat and, and Matt can read them out. Also, if it's during the talk, I'm happy to answer your know, questions in the middle. Um, so now I've shown you this, this kind of shape and told you that the frequencies arrive at different times or the frequency changes. What we actually think has happened, what happens is this frequency doesn't like the frequency doesn't change when the signal gets emitted, but while the signal travels through space, the signal travels at different speeds in light um, of, of light basically. So if electromagnetic radiation travels through the universe, it um, the high frequencies travel a bit faster than the low frequencies. So this is illustrated here in this picture with the blue light or the blue radio waves um, traveling faster and arriving earlier than the lower frequencies. And if you look at different frequencies in those arrival times, you would see kind of this peak, the signal arriving later and later. And if you now convert this, so all these lines, you would make them a row in this waterfall plot, then you get to the plot that I showed earlier. Um, so this is what we call the dispersion of the fast radio burst. And um, the more it is dispersed, kind of the more it has traveled through space. That's kind of the basic idea. But we get to back to this dispersion in a second. Now you will surely want to know Okay, where do these fast radio bursts come from? What causes them? Uh, one of the first things astronomers checked was, okay, is it maybe some device in our um, telescope? Is it the microarray that we opened too early? Or is it some other you know, noise contribution? And people have, have worked on that, have made very sure not to open microarrays, and it turned out to be not, nothing from telescopes. So then theorists got to work and put up loads of theories of what fast radio bursts could be. We have everything from, from alien light sails to evaporating black holes, cosmic string, strings, colliding neutron stars, and um, really lots of theories that people have um, written down. And we don't know what fast radio bursts are yet. So we haven't had a solution so far, although we have a few clues. One of the most important clues is uh, a while ago, we found a signal that looked like a fast radio burst, just slightly weaker. And this signal, um, came from a magnetar in our galaxy. So a magnetar is a just a very strongly magnetic neutron star. And, and we know those in our galaxy, they're known objects, and we have a few. And this kind of fast radio burst-like signal that we observed came from one of those magnetars. So that's why we think maybe magnetars are the source of fast radio burst. But maybe they're also only the source of a few of them. We don't really know. Um, so that's that's still a bit of a mystery, but we're getting closer to the solution. Now in terms of where in space they come from, we actually have quite a good idea. Um, so you remember how I talked about this dispersion and said it's very dispersed. And depending on how much it is dispersed, we can tell how far it has traveled. And in fact, the amount of dispersion that you can get if you just travel through the Milky Way. So let's say this fast radio burst comes from somewhere at the other end of the Milky Way and travels through us. It doesn't get enough dispersion or not as much dispersion as we actually measure. So that tells us it must come from outside of our galaxy. It must be actually really far away. And we have already um, measured fast radio bursts with the dispersion that corresponds to, um, oh, sorry, I think this number might not be um, correct on the screen. Uh, anyway, billions of light years away, so very high distances. And um, basically, they come from some galaxy far away, travel through the intergalactic medium. So that's basically empty space, but it's not completely empty. There are a few electrons and protons flying around, and those cause the dispersion of this fast radio burst. So these cause um, kind of the slope to be created. And eventually they arrive in our Milky Way, 
and get detected by our telescopes on Earth. And actually, we've been discovering quite a lot of those fast radio bursts. So um, I have here a graphic of um, the FRBs discovered as a function of time. And this only goes to 2019. I don't have the most the latest data. Um, but you see, the amount we discover per year went up like crazy just because we start to search for them now, like really, we start to use more telescope. We will build new telescopes soon to search for them. So most of the detections earlier have just been from telescopes that weren't really designed to find fast radio bursts. And we could potentially find way more if we just look at the right, right place in the sky and look at the right time, because those fast radio bursts could just appear anywhere and they could well, they basically anywhere where there's a galaxy in the sky, which is pretty much most directions. And there could be as much as one FRB per minute anywhere in the sky. It's just that you have to point the telescope in the right direction to find it. And you see here on this graph, these red bars are the CHIME telescope that I showed you earlier, this cylindrical telescope. And the reason this telescope is discovering so many fast radio bursts is because it has such a wide field of view. It essentially scans the whole sky every night and the chance that it might hit an FRB is quite likely. Actually, this morning I checked the database and there were already two repeating FRBs found uh, this year in January, so 3rd and 7th of January. And those are repeating FRBs. They are kind of currently a distinguishment between FRBs that we have found to repeat so that we're from the same place, we get a radio burst multiple times, maybe after days or, or longer distances, um, and other FRBs where we have only ever found one from a certain direction. Doesn't mean they don't repeat, it just means we haven't seen the repeat yet. Now, um, I say these signals travel to us. Of course, they travel to us with roughly the speed of light, except for you know small changes due to this dispersion, which is a very fast speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. But actually, it's not that fast. Um, if you think of, say, the moon, um, and imagine you have a friend on the moon, and you wave to them, it'll take about a second for the light to that bounces off your hand, but which you're waving to travel through the moon and another second for the signal to come back. So it's actually not that, not that fast uh, in, in kind of astronomical terms. Um, think of Mars. It'll take four minutes for a signal to go to Mars and back. So um, what do you think would it take for a signal to come from our nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy? Um, well, in fact, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away, roughly which means if you wave someone on the Andromeda galaxy, they won't see it for two and a half million light years or uh, years. Or in other words, whenever we look out into space at very distant galaxies, such as those where we look with fast radio burst, we look into the past, we look into um, the cosmic history. So essentially we have built a time machine, admittedly a one-way time machine. We can only look back, we can't look forward. Um, but there's already something. So let me tell you a little bit about kind of the cosmic history that we have here. And um, essentially, we know roughly that about 14 billion years ago, um, the universe started with, with the Big Bang. So we don't know exactly what happened or how it happened, but we know that it basically was kind of a big explosion um, with the universe being very hot and expanding very rapidly. And after about 380,000 years, we have the point where um, the CMB is emitted. So that's roughly here, uh, which is kind of the first really good observation we have of the universe. And at that point, the universe was a lot colder, not as hot anymore, and a lot calmer. And it cools down further and further. And until about um, a few tens of millions of years, we have the first stars in the universe. So until that time, there's basically nothing we can really observe. Then we have the first stars, and we get more and more stars. The universe gets ionized. And eventually, we get to the time, like today, where we have the universe full of galaxies and galaxy clusters and Maybe there are stars in those galaxies, and around those stars, you might find solar systems and eventually our planet Earth. And if you look at this kind of history, there are parts uh, at the very end here around our solar system, maybe our galaxy, that we have seen since ages, since anti antiquity and prehistoric times, right? We have seen other planets and stars since a very long time. And it took a while for us to see the rest of cosmic history. So in the 1900s, and especially in the 1990s, we have made really good observations of the very early parts of this cosmic micro background, especially with satellites that we have sent to space. And um, in the kind of since the 1980s, we've started to kind of um, catalog and look at all these galaxies that are very far away and make galaxy catalogs, try to understand the large scale structure of the universe. 
Um, but there's a gap in this history. There's a gap over here because in this dark, what we call dark ages, there were no stars yet, right? So you have the universe that's just cooling down. It just stopped kind of emitting the cosmic microwave background. So that's the universe is full of hydrogen and a bit of helium, but nothing that shines yet, no stars that shine light. And um, these are kind of the areas that we want to observe with upcoming telescopes. So the square kilometer array will help us kind of um, explore this area of the universe. And once we have the first stars and the first galaxies, that's a regime where we might be able to see something with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and what we think is happening there, of course, we don't know exactly yet, is that we have the universe being full of, of hydrogen, and we have some regions of hydrogen that are slightly more dense and some that are slightly less dense. So the overdense regions, so the ones where there's a bit more hydrogen, they will be somewhat heavier, which means gravity will pull hydrogen into this region and the density will grow and grow and it will kind of clump together and become um, more and more dense. And eventually you can, via this way, via gravity, you form um, galaxies and in those galaxies you form stars. So once the hydrogen gets dense enough together that it can start fusion, you will have a star that shines light and it emits lots of energy. And that's kind of how we think stars get created. But in this early galaxy, you have all this hydrogen around it. So what we think happened is that these early stars started to emit radiation and destroy those hydrogen atoms. So from hydrogen atoms, which is just a proton and an electron being together in one atom, those electrons get kicked out of the, um, of the hydrogen atoms because all the radiation from the stars, all this light and the UV radiation can um, kind of separate those two particles. So in the universe today, if you would go somewhere in the random position in space and would look at what you find, you won't find hydrogen gas, you'll find protons and electrons in kind of a plasma. So they are, um, you'll find ionized gas essentially. And the process that we, we think this happened, this is kind of a part of my, of my research and we're working on simulating this, is essentially we think, okay, the first stars formed at some point in history. So on the left is kind of the early part of cosmic history. And um, those stars started to emit light. So they create kind of bubbles of universe where the universe starts to be ionized. So around it, you still have this normal universe full of hydrogen, but then around those first stars, you have bubbles of, of ionized gas. And those bubbles grow and grow as the stars continue to, continue to shine and as you continue to get more and more stars. And eventually the whole universe will be ionized like we know it today. Um, so today where we have had stars for a very long time, the universe is essentially ionized. And that's now to come back to the fast radio burst, why those fast radio bursts are dispersed. So the, what I said earlier about different frequencies of radio radiation traveling at different speeds. So the high energy and short, um, short wavelength, high frequency waves traveling faster than the low frequency waves. Um, this is due to those electrons flying around in space. So due to this ionized gas, which means that if we use uh, this property, we can try to find out when the universe was ionized. So we don't have a fast radio burst that is from this far away yet, but we might um, get one eventually. And in that case, we could look at a fast radio burst from a certain distance and we could calculate, okay, it should be this much dispersed. It should have traveled through this amount of electrons. But if it is so far away that um, the, the delay doesn't match up. So if, if the delay between say the high and low frequencies is lower than what you would expect, it could be because the fast radio burst comes from a time where the universe was still neutral and it wasn't as ionized as we know it today. Um, and this kind of we could use as a probe of figuring out when the universe was ionized. So essentially the further back we go with fast radio burst, the further, the older we find, um, the older sources we find, the earlier of the universe we can, we can probe, we can find out, okay, when was this ionization? When did this happen? When did the universe change from being a very neutral universe to being very ionized? And the other thing we can do with these is we can look at, say, the expansion of space. Imagine you are here on Earth and in the center of, the, of this map of, of galaxies, and you observe fast radio bursts from um, far away. What we can tell is from those, from the redshifts of those sources, is we can tell how, um, from what time the fast radio burst was emitted. But from its dispersion, from this delay between the frequencies, we can tell what distance the fast radio burst has traveled. And this will tell us how large the universe is and how much it has, has expanded. Because the one thing gives us the distance and the other thing gives us essentially the, the age or the redshift of this, um, of this source. 
And uh, additionally, of course, we can measure what is in the universe, how much, how much stuff is there, how many electrons, how many baryons are there. Because as I said earlier, the dispersion occurs due to the ionized uh, material in the universe. So if we have more electrons than, um, than we think in the universe, then the dispersion will be higher. Or if we have fewer electrons, the dispersion will be less, um, like the fast radios will be less disturbed, dis dispersed. And this is actually what people have done. So they have used fast radio burst to measure how many electrons are there kind of around us in the, in the medium and have found those kind of electrons that were missing before. Um, so that's a really good, good um, observation. And I think fast radio bursts are really um, interesting probe because essentially it's, it's a measurement of how many electrons are there between me and the source. So how much, how much normal matter is there? And that's something we can otherwise um, mm, that is otherwise really hard to measure. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with, with a few more images, um, what I showed earlier. And yeah, please, please ask me all your questions. Uh, wonderful, Stefan. Thank you so much. It's so I love hearing about fast radio bursts. It's really, it's really just cool to tackle something that's right on the edge of uh, what we can possibly understand. Um, yes, as Stefan said, any questions that you do have, please uh, pop them there. Um, in the YouTube chat. Uh, I'll start off with a question that came through about halfway through, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, was the infamous wow signal potentially a fast radio burst? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, I think the wow signal was a pulsar, right? Um, so I think this was a similar signal that's also kind of a very strong burst, but it wasn't a fast radio burst. And the difference between those two is, I think, in both both the strength so pulsars we usually observe from within our galaxy so we can't I, I, I my understanding is that we don't know what the wow signal was at all oh okay uh, okay my impression was it was a okay in that case uh, well i don't know um what's the so, the, so the I think so. Thing. So I think so. My 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 thing is that is the answer is no. So it's it's unexplained because of how bright it was, uh, but it lasted for more than a minute. Ah um, yes, okay. Which which means it, I, I think it, it can't be a fast radio burst for that reason. It's definitely something weird, but not an FRB. I think is the answer, right? Right. Yes. Um. So yes, the fast radio bursts are very short bursts. So what you see, if you see on this on this um, graphic here, the whole burst lasted for about half a second, or you know, a few hundred milliseconds. Um, but the individual burst at each frequency is only much much shorter. So this is like maybe ten milliseconds or something. So that's why we call them fast radio bursts, even though the actual burst can be a bit longer. Um, and yeah, it's definitely not in the scale of minutes. Um, so even if this is much more dispersed, you won't get like the most you could get here is maybe seconds, but not um, not minutes of a signal. Yeah, I, th I think the wow signal didn't show any dispersion as well. It was just this sort of constant radio blast for about a minute or something, and then okay. never saw it again. So yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone knows what it is. I think it's people say it's one of the best candidates for an extraterrestrial signal. I suspect it might've been like a, a radar, you know, radio reflection of some space debris or something, but who knows? <laughs> um, okay, so a question from CJ uh, says, so light gets redshifted. Um, so do, do these FRB signals get redshifted as well as dispersed as they travel through the universe? Yes, that's very correct. And they do indeed get get both this first and redshifted. Um, so the redshift will change the frequencies. So you can think of, if you look at, at this waterfall diagram, what the redshift will do is move the whole plot kind of upwards or downwards. It will move it downwards to redshift it, to make the frequency lower. Um, but the dispersion will turn a kind of straight line, a horizontal vertical line into this diagonal line. So those are the two effects. And yes, they, they both happen. Wonderful. And the further well, away a source is, the higher it's redshift. Wonderful. That that looks like it for the questions. Well, so thank you, Stefan, so much for such a fascinating talk. Um, I can't wait. Maybe you can come back in a few years and tell us, uh, you know, tell us what the answer is to all these all these fascinating mysteries. Um, observers, how are things looking at your end? Can you still see the stars? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. In that case, I will hand over to the uh, very capable Brian of the Cambridge Astronomical Association to take you around the night sky. Okay, thank you, Matt. Okay, we'll start with David out at uh, Halton, and uh, let's see what you've got. Because today we're going to have a 
a look at the constellation of Orion, which is in the southern part of our sky. It's a large rectangle of stars with three bright stars in the middle, making up the belt of Orion. But our story starts here in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer, which is nearly overhead at the moment. And what we can see is we can see a bright star illuminating a great uh, uh, field of gas and dust. If you can point to the star, we can... You're just tweaking things. I've got some cloud. <clears throat> All right. We'll live with the cloud. You're, you're using a hydrogen alpha filter to, today, <laughs> which helps see through cloud a bit, doesn't it? See through the hazy cloud. Yes, and especially in the presence of a bright big moon. Yeah, we, we, yeah it's just gone full moon. Uh, I notice there's a line running by the star. It, that, that thing, what, what is that? I've got something on my um, hydrogen alpha filter. It might be a <laughs> sleeping lace wing or something of that sort. Okay, right. We're just I'll investigate. No to, no to ignore that, but, but that's, uh, that's nicely positioned by this uh, star. And this star is known as A.E. Auriga. And the gas cloud that it's lighting up is known as the Flaming Star Nebula. And this is a, a hot, massive star that's just visible to the naked eye uh, in a dark sky. And it's also called the Runaway Star. And it's charging along in a northerly direction. And of course, telescopes give upside down images. So this star is heading downwards as it heads north. So it's going that way here. And it's, it's traveling at the best part of a hundred, uh, a half a million kilometers an hour. So it's really motoring. And if you trace that uh, direction back, it comes from the Orion, near the Orion Nebula. And this star, uh, was kicked out of Orion after being in a collision two and a half million years ago. Um, by good fortune, this star, it's about 20 solar masses, just happens to be passing by this gas cloud. It's nothing to do with it. It's just lighting it up as it whizzes past. And it's lighting the uh, gas cloud up in two ways. First, just by reflected light from this bright star. And also, the ultraviolet from this star is exciting the gas and making it glow. So it not only is it a reflection nebula, it's a, an emission nebula. This, the emission nebulas are when the um, gas gets excited by a bright star. And that usually creates the uh, red pinky colour we see in the, these uh, gas clouds. But unfortunately, hydrogen alpha doesn't give you a colour image. And astronomers have found that this, uh, in the infrared and x-rays, in front of or below this star as it heads northwards is a bow shock or a bow wave in front of this star uh, that as it plows through the outer layers of this uh, gas cloud. But eventually the star will pass through the gas cloud and the flaming star nebula will flame no more. So we've only got another 20,000 years before the star <laughs> passes through. Okay, we'll come back to you in a bit and head off to Jonathan. How you doing, Jonathan? Is it cloudy? I'm doing okay. It's, it's a bit of a mess, but uh, I've got this image I captured just a few minutes ago. Excellent. So no, we can, we can see it. It's great. And uh, this is... Uh, the lower part of the Orion Nebula. And again, we see this pinky colour, which is the emission part of the nebula. 
And this is, of course, in, in, in the great uh, constellation of Orion. And then the grey, bluey colour uh, at the top is uh, Reflection Nebula. And your cursor is very near to the trapezium. You take, yeah, there, so there we are. That's, that's the, what we looked at last week in quite considerable detail. But I didn't want to cover the uh, Orion Nebula. Uh, what I wanted to cover was the star just below it. And this, that one there to the left, that's it. Iota Orionis is what I want to talk about. The, this star, the Orion Nebula, and one or two other stars make the belt, I mean, make the sword of Orion hanging down from the belt. And it's quite easy to see in binoculars. But this is the area where the runaway star originated uh, from near the trapezium two and a half million years ago. We just saw the image build up a bit then. And that uh, star is actually two stars. So what has happened? Somewhere near the trapezium, a binary pair of stars met another pair, another binary pair, and the four stars collided and sort of merged into a, a very chaotic orbit. And two of them were ejected. One was headed northwards into the constellation of uh, the charioteer that's now lighting up the uh, flaming star nebula, while the other one headed southwards and ended up in the constellation of the dove. And the other two stars that were left are now make up that star you're pointing at, Iota Orionis. And these are the two biggest stars from each pair. And they're in a chaotic orbit. And when they at the closest approach, they're about a quarter the distance between uh, Mercury and the sun. And for stars, massive stars like that, that is uncomfortably close. And when they get close together, the gravity pulls them out of shape, just like getting a balloon and pulling the nozzle, you end up with a teardrop. And this is what happens to these two stars as they get close every, every once every 29 days. So they're in a very tight orbit and it's, uh, it's very bad for them. But they're of different ages. That's how we know this collision happened. One, one of the giant stars is half the age of the other. So we know they can't have formed together. They must have come together. And the other two stars match their ages. And so this is, uh, the, the, and round the Iota Uranus is a cluster of stars. And originally, it was thought to be a very close cluster to uh, the Earth. But recent measurements by the Gaia satellite has put them at the same distance of, uh, at, uh, of the Orion Nebula. So they're, they're about 13, 1400 light years away. Good. We'll come back to you in a bit. Okay. And we'll go on to Mick. Hi, Brian. It's Mick. Hi. I'm Hi. having trouble. I've managed to get it in focus, but now I've got a large piece of cloud in front of me. So. Oh, that, not to worry. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to you and see if you've got it. Okay. So... We'll go back to David. Are you are you ready for the next one, David? I think you're muted, David. At the moment, I am. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm not ready, unfortunately. Okay. Right. 
So, he, he, Jonathan, have you got anything up your sleeve? Yeah, I can give you a series, as we discussed before. Okay. Me, here it comes. Right, we'll give Iran a, lef- a rest for a while because that's uh, uh, under cloud. Right. Now, this is a first. We've been doing these uh, live observing sessions for 33 years. And this is the first time we've ever shown you an asteroid. Yeah, I, I know some of you are very underwhelmed at the moment. It's hard, hard it's pretty feeble. But Ceres is the largest asteroid by far and was the first one to be discovered way back in 1801. Uh, It was found by a Catholic priest, uh, Giuseppe Piazzi. And at first, Piazzi thought it was a comet because it moved against the background of stars. But after he'd observed it for a month, he suggested that the speed was so slow and uniform that it might be something better than a comet. And later, it was confirmed as the first asteroid to be found. And it takes just about four and a half years to complete an orbit around the sun. And like many asteroids in the asteroid belt, they orbit between Mars and Jupiter. Now, Ceres has a diameter of just under a thousand kilometers, which makes up about a quarter of the mass of all the asteroids in that asteroid belt. But because of its size, in 2006, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. So, and same with a Pluto. Pluto was downgraded from a planet to a dwarf planet. But Ceres has been well studied by the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which orbited Ceres in 2015. And it sent back data and images until it ran out of fuel three years later. But Ceres has has a lot of water for a body in the asteroid belt. It's made up of about 25% water, which means that it's actually got more water than the Earth. So if you collect up all the oceans, lakes, rivers, and so on, and put it in a, in a, a one lump, Ceres has got a bigger lump. <laughs> but there may even be pockets of briny liquid water on Ceres. But it's so salty, even at minus 22 degrees centigrade, it's still liquid. But think of it more as a a mud rather than something you can go scuba diving in. So that's Ceres. And uh, every so often it comes round and it it can be picked up in binoculars if you've got a, a, a finder map to locate it. It's actually sitting in Taurus at the moment, isn't yes, it? Yes, not, not, not too far from the Pleiades. Yeah. Yeah. And the, to, uh, for the next few nights, it's quite near a couple of bright stars. So if you find a, a, um, a find, a, a, get a finder map, a good website to get it off is Heavens Above. And that will mm. give you a, a finder map to find this asteroid. And once you've picked it up with binoculars, you can see it move over the uh, over a, a night or two. OK. David, right. how are you getting on? <laughs> um, let, me sh- uh, let me show you what I'm looking at, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit a bit strange. Um, I think this is <laughs> I think this is our target. Oh yes, yes, that's I and mean, it's right it's right on the edge of my field. No. So um, just trying to uh, you're gonna tweak it, are you? A bit of tweaking with the telescope to get onto it. And okay. if you come back in a few minutes, I might I might be there. Right. We'll carry on and uh, see how uh, uh, Mick's doing. Has the cloud gone yet, Mick? That's <laughs> 
Hang on, let me bye, just bye. show you. That's what I'm getting at the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, lo- I love That's it. exciting. I love live shows, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I I believe you've got a... Uh, did you get, manage to photograph... Uh, Jonathan, did you manage to pick up an image of um, the comet... Uh, no, I didn't, because I have a house in the way. Um, I did get an image of the flame nebula, if you'd like that. And so that's ah. Orion nebula again. Yeah, yeah, go for that. I'll give you that. Oh, that's come out go. really well, yeah. Yeah. And the bright star is one of the three stars in the belt of Orion. So... This is uh, the, the, the uh, next to this it. You can see the, the left hand. One. Yeah, yeah, the left hand one of the uh, belt of Orion, and you've got the flame nebula to the left of it, which is. Uh, but it's it's being illuminated, but strangely not by that star. There's another star off the field of view, that is uh, illuminating that patch of gas, and. If we go back to the Orion constellation, which I said was a large rectangle, there are two huge molecular molecular clouds behind it. And uh, the the, the A molecular cloud covers the bottom half of Orion. So that's the Orion Nebula. Whereas the B molecular cloud which is absolutely huge, many times bigger than the A cloud, covers the top half of the uh, Orion uh, from the belt upwards. So this is part of the molecular cloud. We could only see it in one or two places where a cluster of stars, or a single star in this case, uh, lights it up. I'm and, just going to uh, try and give you a bit of brightness and you see a bit more of it. Okay. And this... Uh, Maybe not. No, that's all I can get, actually. Though. No, that's come out pretty well. Oops. Mm. Oh, it's having a think about life. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so this is obviously the flame nebula, not to be confused with the flaming star nebula uh, back in Ar- <laughs> Ar- Riga. Yeah, we've got two, two very similar names here. But uh, about three million years ago, there, this g- gas cloud formed a load of stars. And one of them is the bright star that is off the field of view that is lighting this. But other stars that uh, formed were smaller things like brown dwarfs, where the nuclear processes have not started up. The the star is so small, uh, nuclear fusion isn't taking place. And also, uh, a lot of rogue planets were formed uh, during this period. And the rogue planets are similar to the mass of Jupiter, but they don't orbit around the star. They just freely roam amongst the uh, star cluster. So this this is uh, part of the gas cloud we can see, and it various parts of it condense down into star clusters. And of course, the most famous one is the Orion Nebula, which we looked at. Okay, we'll go back to. Uh, yes, I have some. D- David, and we should see his target now. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Now, this isn't too far from that bright star we saw next to the flame nebula. The flame nebula is imagined just a a little way above the top of this picture and next to 
the bright star at the left star of the uh, belt of Orion. Uh, it's called Alnitak. And so this is uh, the famous Horsehead Nebula. And this is where the um, David's filter really comes in because it's extremely faint and very difficult to see. Um, with the moonlight about, you've done a cracking job. And all it is, is a, a cold, dark gas, a finger of cold, dark gas, obscuring our view of a gas cloud that's been lit up by a Sigma Orionis. And to give you a scale, you can see it's in the shape of a horse's head, hence the name, the horse head nebula. And from the tip of its snout to the back of its mane is three light years. So uh, this gives you a, a scale. And this is uh, part of the uh, B molecular cloud that's being illuminated. And gradually, these, uh, these, uh, th this will change slowly over time as, as the finger of cloud passes over it. But that's, that's a good picture. And this, uh, the, uh, the whole region we're looking at is between uh, um, 13 and 1400 light years away. So it's a, a fair distance away. And these are uh, 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 all, the, all the things we're looking at are roughly the same distance away. So the stars that make up Orion are sort of in front of these molecular clouds. So they're a lot, lot closer. Right. Are we, are we any closer, Mick? Um, hang on. I'll share the screen, but I've, the computer's crashed. Oh, dear. I've got a bit of an image, but that's... that's the, the computer's that's, crashed. No, that's good enough. Now, what we're doing... Yeah, we can see it's drifting slightly. What we can see in the bottom corner is the uh, trapezium, the four stars that have... Uh, make up the, the, the central bit of the Orion Nebula. This is the top part of the Orion Nebula. And what uh, Mick was hoping to get is round on the left is another star, but you can see a nebula around it. Uh, and it should be clearer than this because it's slightly yes. out of focus. Yeah, it's a computer. I can't do anything with it at the moment. Okay. So what well, I'm we running, might... I'm running the telescope off the laptop and the laptop's crashed. <laughs> <laughs> Not to worry. What we'll do is we'll come back to this one next week uh, because it's the main nebula which is just disappearing is called M42 or Messier 42 or the Orion Nebula. And this one is M43, but it's quite an important nebula. But I'll, as I say, I'll come back to this when we've got it sharp and clear. So we can count you out, can we, from now on? So we'll, yes. see, we'll see if uh, anybody's got anything else. David, have you got anything else? Um, I've just turned to M42. We can have a look at it in H-alpha. Okay. I'm just waiting for the exposure to finish. It won't be in in colours as we saw here. No, not the glorious colours. We just have to use our imagination. Um, I've got a minute to wait. Oh, crikey. Um, if, I, if I just share the screen, you can watch it come up with me. So there's, I've moved from the horse head. I'm taking a two minute exposure uh, yeah. in H alpha and it's binned four by four. So <laughs> I'm really trying hard to get uh, 
uh, get a picture with a single shot. Nearly there. Where can we see the timer anywhere? It's here. Where I've lost it. Bottom left. There we go. There we go. Right, that's good. Wow. So this is the unstretched image. Yeah. See, we've we've blasted out the trapezium. And and but just below it is M forty three. Um. That's the M M forty three is the one just above. Yeah, that's it. That's is that also known as the Running Man. Is that the one? I, I believe so. This there. is Running Man. I beg your pardon. This is M. That's M forty three. The little lump. If I um, well, while you chat about this, I will uh, take another shot, but a short exposure. Okay. Seconds and see what comes up. Well. The little little lumpy bit just above uh, or just below the Iran Nebula is M forty three, and everybody overlooks it. It's a tiny little emission nebula, and it's only a couple of light years across. Whereas the main Iran Nebula above it is forty light years across. But the the the, the reason it's so important is that uh, the uh, they've they've de recently done some research on uh, the emission of carbon monoxide in both M42 and M43 um, by observing the spectra of both 43 and 42, M42 and M43, they've managed to work out that their motions, and by using computer modeling of these gas clouds, they've found that M43, the little one, is charging into the main bulk of the cloud which houses M42, the Iran Nebula. And what it's done, it's compressed the gas. And that's what's started the form, star formation in the Iran Nebula. So without that collision of uh, the M43 hitting the gas cloud, we wouldn't see the Iran Nebula because the, the star forming process wouldn't have started. So that that's why uh, I, I feel this little 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 bit of uh, gas cloud is overlooked, but it is quite important considering what what it's doing. It's as as what happens as gas gets compressed, stars start to the gas starts to uh, form into lumps, and the lumps gradually condense down into uh, stars. And that's why we've got uh, that uh, Orion Nebula. And the trapezium is just big stars, the four main big stars that have formed. There are hundreds of others of smaller stars, some of them so young, they've still got uh, uh, gas clouds around them. And they're called proplids. They're sort of pro proto solar systems just starting to get going. This ha this cloud charged into the other one uh, about three million years ago. So it's it's very he recent history as far as uh, astronomy is concerned. And again, we've got another finger of material going over the Iran Nebula. There's sort of a, a bite out of it. Yeah, there. That's a, a, a denser piece of gas that is unlit, that's creating a silhouette over the cavity. And this cavity has been blown out by uh, the brightest star of the trapezium. So it's like looking into the bite of an apple. Okay. That's uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, we've 
this is real live observing, if you like. I'm changing the camera parameters Yeah. as we are watching. Take another shot. So I'm reducing the exposure time at the moment. There's, this is 43. Yeah. And we can just see the trapezium. And the uh, trapezium is now coming into view. Yeah. Reducing exposure time. There we are. There we go. And it's the bright one at the top. That one. The, that one? No, no. Go, go. That, that one. That's the, the, the biggest star that has formed of many hundreds in the star cluster. And that's the star that has blown out uh, the gas cloud, made this cavity that we're looking into. And it's, uh, the cavity is uh, illuminated by all the stars. So that's, that's a cracking shot. Now, this is just five seconds coming up. All right. Yeah, we can see the Iran. The, there we are. Of course, when Galileo, we can see all four stars. When Galileo first turned his telescope, his, his optics weren't so good and he could only see three stars. But even with a pair of binoculars, you will see the trapezium if you can hold your binoculars steady, just lean them against a wall or something. Mm. But it will show the gas cloud and uh, the uh, finger of material uh, silhouetted against it. So it, it will give you uh, a pair of binoculars will give you quite a good view of uh, the Iran Nebula. Right, we're running out of time. So as one of our telescopes has died, I think we'll call it a day. Uh, just like to say thanks to um, Mick, Jonathan and David. And uh, we'll hand you back to Matt. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mick, Jonathan and David, as Brian said. And thank you to Brian, of course, as always, for uh, giving us that wonderful guide to uh, some things in the night sky. I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, we are doing these uh, every Wednesday during the winter, ending uh, at the end of March. Um, unfortunately, of course, for the time being, uh, the pandemic is, is on. And so we are doing these remote on YouTube. Uh, but fingers crossed, we'll be back to normal and doing these face to face in Cambridge starting uh, from October. So see you uh, here on YouTube next Wednesday. Bosh. Very nice.